Hello and welcome to this crash course guide on the respiratory system. Today we're going to be having a look at some of the basic principles underlying this system and then we'll have a look at the anatomy of the upper and lower divisions. And to finish off we'll have a look at the embryology as well. In part 2 and 3 we are going to continue to explore the anatomy and physiology of the respiratory system but for this video we are just going to focus in on the first two points of, anat of anatomy and embryology. But to start off with, let's have a few questions to test what you already know. As always, I'd recommend you pause the videos at this point to give yourself time to think about the answer, um, as I'm not going to do that here because I'm trying to keep these videos as much of a bite-sized chunk as possible. So question one, which of the following does not pierce the diaphragm? In other words, which of the following does not go through the diaphragm? Is it the subclavian artery, the inferior vena cava, the aorta, or the esophagus? Now here, this is a nice easy question to start off with if you understand the logical and anatomical position of all of these structures. And if you do, you'll know it's the subclavian artery that does not go through the diaphragm. The reason for this is the three structures that pass through the diaphragm are the vena cava, so this passes at the vertebral level T8. And the reason these letters are underlined is because it has eight letters corresponding to it passes at T8. Esophagus has ten letters and it passes at the vertebral level T10. And the aortic hiatus, in other words, the point at which the aorta goes through the diaphragm, is at T12, corresponding to the 12 letters in aortic hiatus. Question 2. Which nerve is responsible for innervating the diaphragm? Is it the vagus, the intercostal, the phrenic, or the thoracic? So here, try to think about C345, which is a little way to remember what keeps the diaphragm alive. And here, if you know this, C345 is where the phrenic nerve originates from. And in this plexus here, as you, you can see, you can trace the phrenic nerve back to cervical 3, 4, and 5, respectively, here. And question 3, which of these cannot be measured by spirometry? So a bit more of a tricky question here. So is it functional residual capacity, expiratory reserve volume, the inspiratory reserve volume, or the residual volume? And here, try to think about what spirometry is and what does it measure. And if you do that, you may be able to deduce that it's the residual volume that cannot be measured via spirometry. And we'll explore this in a little bit more detail in either part two or three of this video. So let's start with some basic principles of the respiratory system, i.e. what does it do? Well, its function is to bring in oxygen to the lungs and facilitate its diffusion into the bloodstream so it can pass out to the tissues of the body. Equally, it's got to get rid of the waste carbon dioxide that's coming back from the tissues via exhalation. The res respiration really occurs due to pressure and volume changes. And as you know, with increased volume, the pressure decreases. So as the, shape of a si uh, the size of a shape increases, the pressure within that shape is going to decrease and vice versa. And really, this is the underlying principle behind our respiration. And likewise, vice versa. So the respiratory system can be subdivided into the upper and lower region anatomically. And the upper respiratory tract, we say, is made of the nasal cavity, the pharynx, and the larynx. The lower, therefore, is made up of the trachea, the right and left main bronchus, and the bronchioles and the rem remainder of the lung thereafter. And this can be summarised in this little anatomical diagram here. So anywhere below the larynx, really, we're classing as the lower respiratory tract. And this is important in terms of classification of viral infections, for example, whether it's an upper respiratory tract infection or a lower respiratory tract infection. Moving on, let's think about the simple airflow. And this really does bring it back to basics. The air comes in and it goes through either our nasal cavity or, or, or our oral cavity and back towards the pharynx, down the trachea, and lastly, into the lungs. And it goes through these divisions of the bronchus, through to the um, segmental and lobar bronchi, and so on all the way until it reaches our alveoli at the end, where that gas um, exchange occurs. So let's think about anatomy. This is probably a useful activity to do in your own time to um, try to work out what the labels are, but again, I'm going to go through it fairly quickly. So in terms of anatomy, of course, this is your external nose. This is your nasal cavity, but more specifically, it's your superior meatus, middle meatus, and inferior meatus. These aren't particularly covered in this video, but please do go over these and understand the purpose of the concha or the meatus um, in terms of humidifying air, etc. Moving back, you go into the nasopharynx, and as you move down, you go to the oropharynx, and lastly, the laryngopharynx. And these are the three anatomical subdivisions of the pharynx itself. This, of course, is a tongue, or if you want to. Um, Classify it broadly, it's the oral cavity. And then as you go down, this is the larynx. So as we said, we go from the nasal cavity to the pharynx to the larynx. 
and then obviously if you continue down past the larynx you go into the trachea. In terms of anatomically being aware, the um, structure posterior to the trachea is the esophagus, but obviously this is related to the GI system. These, this is a diagrammatic representation of the paranasal sinuses. So if you think this is your frontal sinus, this is your sphenoidal sinus, this is your ethmoidal, and this is your maxillary, your largest sinus. The importance of these really um, is to possibly lighten the skull or resonate our voice, um, but the actual purpose really is a little more to be desired. We're not fully sure of it. So moving down to the pharynx, Muscle-wise, we have the superior constrictor, the middle constrictor, and the inferior constrictor, which are fairly easy to learn, because obviously you want constriction to occur in the pharynx. But the importance here is which one is which, and being able to label these on a diagram. And be aware as well, this dividing line in the middle here is the pharyngeal raphe. So the raphe is the separation between the two sides there. Moving down is the larynx, and in terms of the larynx, it's really important to be aware of the cartilages that exist. And there are three large unpaired cartilages and three small paired cartilages, and we'll see these in a moment. So first of all, this is a bone that exists within the pharynx, and it's the hyoid bone. Then this is the thyroid cartilage, and if you think about the membrane that exists between there, it has a very logical name of the thyrohyoid membrane. Moving down, this is your cricoid cartilage, and this is your epiglottis. And between these three cartilages here, these make up your three large unpaired cartilages, as we'll see in a moment. Now, for the three small paired cartilages, you've got the arachnoid. Sat on top of the arachnoid, you've got the cuniculate. And then on top of that, even still, is the cuneiform cartilage. So as we said, these are the three large unpaired ones. And these are the three smaller paired cartilages of the larynx. Going down, we've got blood supply and innovation. So if you think about this as a branch of the aortic arch, this is the common carotid artery, and therefore this is the subclavian artery. Going up, you have the internal carotid, and of course the external carotid. That common carotid bifurcates into an internal and external artery. The external further goes into a superior laryngeal and a superior thyroid. Down here, coming off of the subclavian artery, you've got the thyrocervical trunk, and this bifurcates into the inferior thyroid and the inferior laryngeal as it delves further behind, it's a little bit harder to see here. In terms of the innovation to the larynx, you have the um, superior laryngeal and you also have the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And these are really important in terms of lesions of these nerves and the clinical implications of it. Um, but this is something more to do with second year and can be seen in the clinical cases video later on. In terms of the divisions then, of course, you start at the top of, with the trachea coming down, it bifurcates at the carina at T5 into the right main bronchus and the left main bronchus. From the main bronchi, you bifurcate even further still into a secondary or lobar bronchus. And then from there, you go down into the tertiary or segmental bronchus. If you continue down, this is the terminal bronchus. And then eventually you go down to the bronchiole and the alveolar right down there at the bottom. Anatomical differences between the right and left bronchus. The right bronchus is wider, shorter and more vertical. And as a result, therefore, more likely to get a foreign object lodged in if it's inhaled. In terms of the trachea, we've already said it bifurcates of a carina at around the vertebral level T5, and the right lobe has uh, the right lung has three lobes in comparison to the left lung, which has two lobes, and the right therefore has more segments in ten in comparison to the left, roughly having eight. Zoom in on the alveoli, you can see this is the terminal bronchiole, this is the respiratory bronchiole, and then this as a whole is the alveolus. Zoom in even further, you've got the alveolus sac and the duct in the centre. Having a look at the hilum of the lungs, this is the left lung, and therefore this is the right lung, and be able to differentiate between the two anatomically. So this is the left subclavian artery, the aortic arch, the esophagus, this is the inferior vena cava, the esophagus, and the azygous vein. And then right at the top there you've got the right brachycephalic vein, and the superior vena cava. Moving on, if you zoom in on the left lung, you can look at the pulmonary artery, the left main bronchus, and the pulmonary veins. These are really important because they're common to both sides of the lung, but be aware how their anatomical position varies based on whether it's the left or right side. The lungs can be divided into lobes. So we've said we've got the left, which divides into two lobes, and the right, which divides into three, superior, middle, and inferior. These are separated on the left by an oblique fissure, and on the right by two fissures, an oblique and a horizontal. This is the cardiac notch, the place where the heart is going to sit, 
And this, of course, as we've already said, is the tracheal bifurcation of the carina. Looking underneath the diaphragm, this answers one of the questions we looked at earlier. This is the central tendon. And you've got the three most important structures passing through the inferior vena cava, the esophagus, and the aorta. In terms of its attachment, you've got the arcuate ligament, which attaches back there to the transverse process of the vertebra. And as well, you have the crew. So the crew attached on the right side, lower down at the L1 to L3 region, and on the left side, L1 to L2. In terms of taking a lateral view of the mediastinum, this slide can be found in the cardiothoracic video as well. And be aware of the divisions of the uh, mediastinum as well in respect that it's divided into a superior region, and then the inferior can be divided further into an anterior, middle, and posterior region. So moving on to embryology, think about your three basic germ layers, the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. So the mesoderm splits further into a somatic mesoderm, which is next to the endoderm, and a splanchnic mesoderm, which is next to the ectoderm. So try to draw this out in your head. Uh, imagine what this is looking like right now. And the three main body cavities will form in the space between these two mesoderms. So essentially the three main body cavities we need to know about, the pleural cavity surrounding the um, lungs, the pericardial cavity surrounding the heart, and the peritoneum surrounding the abdomen. For the respiratory system, of course, think about the pleural cavity. And the splanchnic and somatic mesoderm then become the two pleural layers, which we'll explore in terms of anatomical um, layout a little bit later on, so the visceral and parietal pleura. And if we look at a step-by-step -step guide now for the embryology, in week four of development, the laryngeotracheal groove forms, and this gives rise to the trachea, the bronchi, and the tracheobronchial tree. So you can see the laryo um, laryngeotracheal groove here, and then develop into a diverticulum um, by the end of week four, and eventually it becomes a respiratory bud. If you take that respiratory bud, it then divides into two outpouchings called our primary bronchial buds. As you can imagine, these are going to become our primary bronchi. These buds continue to grow and sec into secondary and tertiary and so on. And by the end of week five, the bronchial buds have enlarged and their connections to the trachea form the main bronchi. From this point onwards, essentially the lung needs to mature, it needs to grow. It continues up to the age of about eight, so it's not just an in uterine um, process, it's actually going on all up until the age of eight. And we can divide it into four stages. We've got the pseudoglandular stage, which covers six to 16 weeks, the canalicular stage covering 16 to 26, the terminal sac stage, um, 26 weeks to birth, and the alveolar stage, which is 32 weeks onwards to eight years old. Breaking these down, let's have a look at the pseudoglandular, so six to 16 weeks, and by 16 weeks, all the major elements of our lungs have formed, except the most important ones, the ones involved in gas exchange. And therefore, if a fetus is born at 16 weeks, uh, respiration is not possible and it will not survive. Moving on to the canalicular stage now, 16 to 26 weeks. The cranial segments of the lung now develop faster than the caudal, and the lumen of the bronchi and terminal bronchioles are enlarging. Lung tissue becomes vascularized, and therefore resp respiration is possible towards the middle or end of this stage, and babies born as early as 22 weeks now are surviving with hospital support. And this is possible because of the primordial alveolar sacs that are there, and the vascularization. Moving on, we've got the terminal sac stage, so 26 weeks to birth, so more terminal sacs develop, you've got a very thin epithelium, of course, adapted for gas exchange, and the capillaries bulge into those developing alveoli, and adequate gas exchange can now occur if a fetus is born after 26 weeks, usually independently. And this is because lung surfactant has started to be produced, which rapidly reduces the surface tension of the lungs. Also, the capillary networks proliferate, and therefore there's a good vascular um, supply to the lungs by this stage. Alveolar stage now, we're getting on 32 weeks, all the way up to 8 years old. The epithelial lining is becoming thinner and thinner, a squamous epithelial layer of type 1 pneumocytes. And by the late fetal stage, of course, the lungs are now able to respire individually without any medical support. Be aware of the key differences. Well, at birth, the lungs are dependent... Before birth, sorry, the lungs are dependent on the placenta for all the gas exchange, and they're simply a secretory organ um, in the uterus. However, after birth, the lungs have to become capable of gas exchange themselves, and therefore they do this by producing surfactant and having a really good vascularization. So remember, it's an all-around adaptation from being a secretory organ all the way to becoming a gas gaseous exchange organ um, when they are born. That's everything for this um, video. It was quite rushed through towards the end, um, but I really wanted to try and get through anatomy and embryology in this video. But of course, take it at your own pace, uh, and if it's revision, hopefully it's been a really good kind of recap of what um, you basically need to know for anatomy and embryology 
um, and for the respiratory system. Any feedback, please do let me know. Um, and if not, I'll see you in part two, where we'll continue to look at more of the respiratory system. Thank you.